This verse for the long life of His Holiness the Dalai Lama is start with debate. debating about mind. And in the presentation of the mind, there are three topics. It's definition and division. So the definition is given. Definition of a mind is given as that which is clear and knowing. <coughs> So today, mainly the youth of Tibetan I wanted to do the ceremony for Bodhicitta, the altruistic spirit of enlightenment. So it's, a, it's an excellent state of mind, warm-heartedness, kindness, and generating or cultivating bodhicitta. Right from the beginning, when I wake up, I think of all sentient beings across the expanse of space, and particularly human beings on this earth. So I do pray for the benefit, for the, the well-being of all sentient beings in this way. And so it helps in bringing peace of mind and uh, calm state of mind, relaxed state of mind. So it's very beneficial. So I consider cultivating and meditating on bodhicitta very important. And what helps this in turn, or as an uh, assisting contributing factor, is the view of emptiness, meditation on it. And my main prayer is, as long as space endures, as long as space sentient beings remain, may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. So until the space comes to an end, I pledge to work for the well-being of all sentient beings. And so it gives me a real courage to work for others. This determination. So I consider it very important. So it really causes a very relaxed state of mind. And I feel at ease and therefore I'm able to sleep very well at night. So on the other hand, if I were to be, I mean, if uh, it doesn't really bring about, uh, it doesn't cause any disturbance, agitation in my mind. So I feel at ease and sleep very well. And I also visualize Avalokiteshvara, the noble Avalokiteshvara on my crown and then uh, while uh, visualizing him, I recite the Om Mani Peme Hum, the six-syllable mantra, and then uh, fall asleep. So when you are at ease and have peace of mind, 
So it naturally benefits your physical health as well. The, the, the elements of the body are balanced. And so Tibetans, of course, Tibet is considered as the land which is pro, uh, uh, chosen by the uh, Avalokiteshvara. And China is supposed to be, to have this connection with Manjushri, Arya Manjushri. So Tibetans have a very special relationship with Arya Avalokiteshvara. So I too make prayers to Avalokiteshvara and meditate on him. Do we have tea? So the people are already finishing their bread before getting the tea, looks like. The qualities of the Buddha are inconceivable, uh, uh, the qualities of Dharma are inconceivable, and the qualities of the Sangha are inconceivable. And I make this offering to the inconceivable ones. And may all sentient beings enjoy the pure field. So I found the kids eating the bread. Uh, the way they ate seemed like, seems to me like the bread is really tasty. So I wanted also to take some bread. So as you were eating, <laughs> The delicious bread, this tasty bread, and I, if I were to uh, stay without the bread, it's a loss for me. Has anybody not got the bread? Everyone got their bread.
Çöp Halim Ebe. De de de. Bir son yüz asking. Bir son. Tüzüde. Ta pahalı sayar da, vay. The bread is to be eaten.
So today, uh, mainly the Tibetans and other uh, devotees also have gathered here. Tomorrow we are doing the permission, granting the permission to practice uh, Manjushri Jenang. Manjushri Jenang will be done for increasing our intelligence and wisdom, especially for the younger ones. So tomorrow we are going to do the Jenang of Manjushri. Uh, and today we are going to do the uh, so there is a uh, ritual for the bodhicitta by Jetsongkapa, which is very long. No need to do that. So in, Bodhic in Bodhisattva Charya Avatar by Shanti Deva, it says this bodhicitta is something that is worth our reverence and uh, homage. So with this bodhicitta, even if someone harms or hurts you, so the person with bodhicitta doesn't retaliate but think of bringing benefit to the perpetrator and therefore uh, in the world. Also, if you have a good heart, then uh, that's a source of our happiness and joy. So you'll feel at ease and you'll also be able to sleep well, not sighing and you know, rolling back and forth in your bed with an agitated state of mind. But if you have a good state of mind, good, uh, kind uh, state of mind, and bodhicitta especially. So of course it will bring about the ultimate goal of the you know, Buddhahood to oneself, but it really is, even at the immediate level, helpful to bring about a peaceful mind. So for oneself, for one's own benefit, you should have uh, bodhicitta to help, help others also. And also, for temporary benefits, when bodhicitta, and the lasting happiness also bring, is brought about by bodhicitta. And so, so if you are sincerely motivated to benefit all sentient beings, it, it naturally brings about great benefits to oneself. So because of your uh, pure motivation to help others, even though others may misinterpret you, and because of their uh, misinterpretation, misunderstanding, they may be angry with you, and criticize you, but with bodhicitta, you don't feel angry at that person. But bodhicitta, in fact, looks at all sentient beings and thinks of benefiting them. And you know, the people criticizing you and so forth may be seen as out, uh, being done having been done out of their ignorance, and therefore you become more compassionate towards them. So bodhicitta is extremely precious. So I do meditate on bodhicitta very much, and I have quite a good degree of experience of it. And then with regard to Tibetans, when they are atrocious to Tibetans and also destroying uh, you know, the statues and so forth of enlightened beings, 
Uh, they, these acts don't disturb my mind to lose my peace of mind, but in fact, they really, uh, it, it help, Bodhicitta helps me to keep my uh, integrity. So Tibetan, Tibet being the land blessed by Avalokiteshvara, we have as Tibetans, we are used to avoid killing even small insects and bugs. So, regarding myself, I also were very, um, I was very careful not to uh, kill uh, insects and bugs. But at night when I am, I am having a good sleep, and then if a mosquito comes, buzzing, then I grab it. But otherwise, I have compassion and affection towards the Chinese perpetrators. So when you are thinking compassionately, about these people, there is no room for anger and hatred. And because of lacking anger and hatred and so forth, you are able to keep your peace of mind, maintain your peace of mind. So it is very important to take interest in and uh, you know, enthusiast, uh, be enthusiastic about bodhicitta. So I do th meditate on bodhicitta based on equaling and exchanging self and others. And so every morning and evening I do that. It really helps for my peace of mind. So for one's own benefit, for the benefit of others, for temporary gains, and ultimately to reach Buddhahood through the, by progressing along the paths and grounds, everything comes through bodhicitta. So with bodhicitta, every each moment you have, you are able to accumulate huge amounts of merit. And this compassionate heart is very precious. I do meditate on bodhicitta really uh, to a great extent. And so the perpetrators are the objects of my compassion rather than anger and hatred. So, even if someone were to harm me with bodhicitta, it helps to think of their, their benefits instead of harming back. And so, this kind, good heart, bodhicitta, is something, something we should take interest in and, you know, develop it within ourselves with enthusiasm. So, of course, we need to take, be careful about people who wish to harm us. With hatred, you will never be able to win others. But with the altruistic attitude, bodhicitta, it is uh, uh, important to have this state of mind within yourself. And then, in the long run, as long as space endures, as long as sentient beings remain, may I too abide to dispel the miseries of transmigratory beings. So, in other words, for the benefit of all sentient beings, as infinite as the space, you are generating this bodhicitta without losing your courage. But thinking only of benefiting, single-pointedly benefiting them, 
And so in this way, the others, perpetrators and so forth, as long as they are human beings with the intelligence to understand what's going on, their attitude towards you may change. So this is something that we can actually see in our life, and therefore this bodhicitta and kind-heartedness or warm heart is very precious, valuable. And therefore all of us, for all of us, it's very important to have a good heart so, of course, we may recite mantras and say prayers and, you know, beat drums and so forth. But the most important thing in our practice is bodhicitta, compassion is something that we somehow neglect in our practice, uh, whereas we emphasize playing all these musical instruments, reciting mantras, and this is wrong. So being close to these different ritualistic you know, instruments and not uh, the bodhicitta and altruistic attitude is wrong. So because of our connection through karma and our uh, positive energies, it is very important for us to have good heart. So, of course, in the world, people consider Tibetans to be kind-hearted. So we should also be enthusiastic about cultivating it further so that it helps the Tibetan cause and also the uh, teaching of the Buddha. So with, uh, you know, uh, when you, uh, have, even if you may have education, if you have uh, uh, negative thoughts and emotions and uh, thinking of, you know, hurting others, harming others, that's not really uh, beneficial. So, for example... As far as uh, concerning myself, I don't, at first I'm not claiming to be somebody very special, but I consider bodhicitta to be really crucial. And then for when I have people who criticize me, I cultivate uh, uh, compassion towards them and I don't become angry at them. And therefore, good heart is really important. So this is not about a few years, one or two years, or one or two lifetimes, but as long as space endures, and as long as sentient beings remain, sentient beings who are under the sway of their karma and mental afflictions, I feel determined to serve, to benefit them without losing my heart and determination to work for them as long as the sentient beings remain. I feel determined to serve them, to benefit them. Therefore, bodhicitta might, of course, bodhicitta may, uh, you know, may be taken to be for others, but in practical terms, it really brings happiness, benefit to yourself. So, bodhicitta is that factor which truly brings your well-being. So I always am enthusiastic about this. And you are my Dharma friends and my uh, disciples. So all of you also should take interest in and be enthusiastic about bodhicitta. So when you find someone to be uh, kind-hearted, 
I mean, everyone likes that person. So it is very important for us to have a good heart. Today, in China proper also, when I give such teachings on compassion, bodhicitta, there are more and more P Chinese taking interest in my teaching, and through that, taking interest in the teaching of the Buddha, and therefore the Dharma, where it has not spread before, and also where it has spread before but declined, may I illuminate that treasure of uh, benefits. As this prayer says, you should also pass this message to others that the His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, teaches us to have good heart, warm heart. And so, Bodhicitta is essentially about having a good heart, warm heart. So we are not going to use long uh, uh, rit ritual for Bodhicitta, but so I sometimes recite this. So meditating on aspiring bodhicitta and uh, also uh, the conventional bodhicitta and the uh, ultimate bodhicitta. So everyone down to the small insects in ants and so forth. Nobody needs to be neglected or pushed aside, but they are all worthy of our uh, affection and compassion. So, for example, a butterfly, if a butterfly has fallen into a body of water with a good heart, a sincere good heart, you, if you try to save its life, and similarly, if you uh, try to help uh, animals that have fallen into water, which live usually on the land, and those who are living in the water but have um, you know come out on the land, if you save them to the best of your ability, of course the suffering of sentient beings comes through their karma, which in turn happens because of this unruly mind that they have, but of course the animals may not have that capacity yet to think about what is good and bad so that they are able to avoid the bad actions and take, on, uh, take up the good actions and so forth, but you may still be able to practice and cultivate good karma and also think of and feel determined to uh, have a good heart to benefit all sentient beings. And therefore, as I explained, it is very important and very precious for us uh, to cultivate this good heart of uh, thinking of benefiting all sentient beings. And so, although you are thinking of benefiting other sentient beings, the, you benefit as a byproduct. And so, as the text says, to, ben to fulfill the interests of oneself and others, I shall generate the mind of awakening. So let us meditate on bodhicitta for a while, thinking of all sentient beings across the expanse of space, as infinite as the space. Think this way. Have the motivation or the intention to uh, bring benefits to all sentient beings. And may they be free from all suffering. 
So first of all, may all sentient beings have happiness in its causes, the temporary ones as well as the happiness and joy that they would have in the future. So they have the uh, course to bring about that kind of result within themselves. And so think of bringing happiness uh, benefits to all sentient beings, temporary as well as the lasting ones. So have that determination to bring about benefit and happiness of all sentient beings, the temporary benefit and ultimate happiness for a while. So have this altruistic attitude towards all sentient beings. Meditate on it for a while. And so, so, based on the conventional reality, uh, what you have just uh, generated is the conventional bodhicitta. And the next, the suffering that we undergo is because of attachment to oneself and neglecting others. And so now you need to check where this I is. Where is yourself? Is it in your head? In your heart? Or on the lower parts of your body? Where is it? You have a sense of an eye. Where is it? Somewhere here at the heart. If you are asked, is your head your you? It is your head, but not you, isn't it? And my, your heart is not you, but your heart. So we, think, we say, my body, my head, my heart, but where is that I. We talk about myself and others, self and others. Where is that I that you refer to by self? So though this self or the I appears as if it has some kind of solidity, but if you try to f search for it, you will not find it. Yet, it, is, it exists merely by way of designation on the basis of our psychophysical aggregates. So I, or the person, is de merely designated on the basis of the psychophysical aggregates. So though, the, when, you, when you think of an I, when you think of yourself, this I appears as if there is some kind of a lump or you know, a solidity. But if you search for its identity through various reasonings, in various ways, you will not be able to find it anywhere. And regarding myself, my name is Tenzin Gyatso. Where am I? Where is Tenzin Gyatso? When you search for the identity, nothing can be pen you know, you can, cannot point your finger at anything as being Tenzin Gyatso. Of course, I eat bread, but where is that me who eats bread? So, when you search for your identity in this way, uh, it only exists by way of designation, but not at all by its own um, characteristics. So if we, we see that I am happy, joyful, and I have lots of problems and difficulties, but nothing whatever can be found if you try to search for that 
I who is suffering or being uh, joyful, this, that I which is uh, an I which is independently existing does not exist at all. So meditate on that lack of an independent, solid I. So when you contemplate in this way, though the eye appears as if it's somewhere in the, here and solidly existing, it is designated on the basis of our psychophysical aggregates, for example, on the basis of uh, the psychophysical aggregates of a dog, a dog is designated. And similarly, on the basis of the aggregates of a human being, a human being is designated. Apart from that designation, nothing whatever can be found to be the eye of the dog or a human being. So this eye cannot be found at all. If you search for its identity from the crown of your head down to the sole of your feet, so, what you find in the end is, though it does not exist from its own side, it exists by way of designation on the basis based on our psychophysical aggregates. And similarly, with regard to Buddha, where is the Buddha? If you try to dissect the Buddha, you know, from its his uh, crown protrusion, hands and legs and so forth, nothing whatever can be pinpointed as being the Buddha as such. But the Buddha exists by way of designation and the uh, dependence on uh, other factors, the Buddha is designated. Everything in samsara and nirvana, though they appear, as if they have some kind of a, a objective existence from their side. So everything in the universe, the things in samsara and nirvana, do not uh, um, do exist by way of designation, by way of name but nothing whatever exists from the, uh, its own side. So meditate on that emptiness. When you look at me, for example, you, you see Yawarambuche, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Of course, what you see, actually see is my body, and you hear my voice, but where is that holiness? In the body and the mind, no, the, the, uh, the voice. So though without doing any kind of analysis, we see things, but as if you can pinpoint to that, being this and that, but nothing whatever exists the way it appears, the way they appear to us. So everything lacks any objective existence apart from being designated. So meditate on that. So if you look for the designated object, nothing can be found from the Buddha if you try to look for the Buddha it, within his psychophysical aggregates, nothing can be found. And similarly, it is the case with our friends and so forth. But that doesn't mean if you cannot find them when you search for their identity, they, it, it doesn't mean that they don't exist, but they exist by way of designation. Dependent origination is how things exist. 
and here dependent origination, these two words. By dependence, you are not rejecting the suchness or the reality of how things are, and by origination, we conform to conventional reality, conventions of the world. So, of course, the Buddha, when you attain Buddhahood, the uh, physical dimension of a Buddha comes through the help of bodhicitta and the Buddha's state of mind, which is pure, uh, you know, uh, omniscient and free from all faults and full of, uh, complete with realization, comes through the uh, meditation, uh, the wisdom of emptiness. And so as soon as I wake up in the morning, I meditate on the conventional bodhicitta and as soon, uh, also emptiness. And therefore, uh, I use these lines from, Bodhisatt uh, from Madhyamaka Avatara, verses 34 to 38. So those things are empty of any inherent existence. It says everything arises from within that state of emptiness. So things though things exist by way of designation, but if you try to look for their identity within themselves, nothing whatever can be found to be this or that at all. So this realization of emptiness uh, uh, serves as the cause for the Buddha's Dharmakaya, which is uh, qualified by these, uh, you know, overcoming elimination of all the faults, defilements, and having the complete, total realization of everything. So ultimately, having a good heart is very important. Being kind, warm-hearted is very important. Keep that in mind that His Holiness the Dalai Lama is advising you and also that you can pass this message to others, your fr friends and so forth, passing this message of His Holiness the Dalai Lama saying that His Holiness teaches us to have good heart, a warm heart. Please do that. So from my side, it is my, the, the, the bedrock of my practice. And together with it, I also contemplate and meditate on the view of emptiness. So... Uh, you, as my disciples and Dharma friends, so you should also think of emptiness as best as you can meditate on it so that you may be able to talk about emptiness and mainly the altruistic state of mind. So when you become someone who really walks the talk of uh, these two principles, then you will you become a true disciple of the Dalai, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. So we have to do the bodhicitta ceremony. So 
So I have, what I have done is uh, the meditation on bodhicitta so far. Huh? So we have some questions. Gishilo Santakbala is saying. So his only is uh, the explanation on bodhicitta and letting us meditate on it. Uh, we should do uh, with that regarding bodhicitta. Meditation on bodhicitta. That should be enough. On behalf of TCV Suja in Bir, I would like to ask this question. The students today would like to indulge in games and unnecessary uh, distractions, but when we do prayers and study, we have difficulty focusing our mind on this. So, regarding the first question, of course, we have distraction. Our minds get distracted. But what we should do is try to gain a focus, uh, ability to focus one's mind on a single uh, focal object. We should gain familiarity with that. Of course, without familiarity, even if you try to focus your mind on one object, it immediately d gets distracted. But we should do both the analytical and the placement meditation, focusing meditation. So you should try to develop that single-pointed focusing meditation which has to come about through familiar, familiarity with your object. So, of course, we should try to stop dist getting distracted to many different objects. So, well, we need familiarity uh, to, dip, to, to dip, uh, build up familiarity with objects so that uh, this single-pointed concentration can be developed. Uh, uh, I come from TCV Chontra, near Bir. I would like to ask this question. My question is, as a student, how should we be students with both the wings? I don't know what that means. So, regarding that, in the past, in Tibet, we didn't have much contact with other countries, Western countries and so forth, um, which are more or less um, engaged with material development alone. So in our tradition, the monastics learn uh, collected topics and when they go into deeper studies there we uh, they learn how to look at things from a very uh, with a uh, broader kind of a, a perspective extensively so in the West, people uh, don't have uh, the, the explanation about the mind, mental consciousness, 
but um, they more or less talk about the uh, sensorial objects, the external. So, of course, modern education in India came from the West. And in their tradition, Western tradition, they do not have vast and profound explanation of the mind, the workings of the mind and emotions and so forth. So, but today, regarding the workings of the, the mind and emotions, many Westerners are taking interest, and I have many uh, people who uh, have discussions with me about mind and emotions. And so with regards to the workings of our mind, psychology, we have lots of dialogues and discussions. So the Western education generally is focused on material development alone, and therefore they don't have much knowledge about the workings of the mind and emotions, whereas in India, Indian tradition, not only Buddhism, but also the non-Buddhist traditions, we, they have a very detailed explanation of the mind and emotions. So the ancient Indian uh, culture uh, have quite a detailed explanation of the mind and emotions or psychology. So we have also compiled books uh, on... So all these are uh, found, the explanations of the mind, psychology is found in Indian works like Masanagarjuna and so forth. So the, the, the detailed explanations are found in the Indian tradition, not in other cultures. So this is the, the, the knowledge about psychology that we have is something that uh, you know, people from the West take interest in these days and pay attention to. So we have the translated words of the Buddha, Kanyur, over 100 volumes, and then the Tenyur, which are the translated uh, commentarial treatises by Indian masters, over 200 volumes. So if we can, if you can pay attention to uh, the explanations of mind and emotions in these uh, text literature, it would be good. This is a praise to His Holiness as being the Avalokiteshwara. So I am asking this on behalf of Upper TCB. So please explain us about Bodhicitta and how to practice bodhicitta. So with regard to bodhicitta, it is the yardstick of the path of Mahayan. So if you have a good heart, <laughs> so that is based on logic and reason. Otherwise, just being kind without much reasoning, you may be considered uh, a foolhardy or something like that. And so, with the help of the wisdom of emptiness, the bodhicitta, and combined with bodhi, uh, the view of emptiness, so bodhicitta helps to come, uh, you know, accumulate merit, positive energies, and wisdom of emptiness re, uh, 
helps in accumulating the wisdom. So by combining these two, in Tibet, of course, in Tibetan tradition, we do study these about the bodhicitta and the view of emptiness and also, uh, you know, put them into practice. So, of course, I respect all religious traditions of the world because all traditions emphasize helping others. And I also praise all these religious traditions. But when it comes to when it comes to explanation about attaining the Buddha's form body, the physical dimension, and the wisdom, uh, Dharmakaya, the, it is, the, the detailed explanation is found in the Buddha's... Uh, so I meet many uh, scholars from Vietnam and also Sri Lanka and so forth. So they don't have as extensive study of these two based on the classic, the great treatises like us Tibetans. And so we have the uh, best kind of a, a tradition of s extensive study of bodhicitta and view of emptiness. This prayer for His Holiness to live long, the one verse prayer. I am. I feel very fortunate to have this opportunity to listen to your teaching and also have this opportunity to ask your question. So today, scientists are paying attention to Buddhism, and Buddhists are also paying attention to signs. What are the similarities and dissimilarities between these two traditions, Buddhism and signs? Please. So science, modern science, has come from the West mainly, and it is focused on material development alone. It doesn't have a profound uh, research on uh, the workings of our mind and emotions. So the study and the knowledge that we have on mind and emotions and the difference between the uh, workings of uh, sensorial perceptions and the mental consciousness and so forth. I meet many scientists who take interest in learning from our tradition. So Western education is related to, uh, an, uh, about mind is more or less related to Christianity, the Judeo-Christian tradition. And mainly the Christian tradition is focused on praying to God, whereas they don't talk about you being your own master. As the Buddha has said, you are your own master. If you want to be good, to have good experience, it is in your hands. The Buddha has said that, and so the Indian masters have actually uh, examined what is the self and how does it exist, and so forth. The Indian tradition has the most profound knowledge about that. With this prayer from the long life prayer of, written by So my question is about focusing your mind on the well, this is about great compassion. So what, what was the experience like when you had great compassion 
which looked at all sentient beings and wished them to be free from suffering. So as even as a child, because of my past uh, habituation from the past life, I was inclined to avoid even hurting a small insects. So right from my childhood, I had a good heart. And then as I grew up, I studied the different Buddhist literature and particularly Bodhisattva Charya Avatara. And today, through my study and having practiced the Bodhicitta, I have quite a good degree of experience of Bodhicitta. I don't claim to be a Bodhis, uh, to have bodh, uh, you know, genuine Bodhicitta within myself yet, but it has this experience that I have come through my contemplation. And me meditating and contemplating about the benefits of cherishing others over oneself, that it brings benefit to oneself and happiness and joy to oneself and others, and also the temporary um, uh, pleasant experiences as well as the ultimate goal of uh, enlightenment will be brought by that. And so when I think about bodhicitta, I am in tears. It really moves me. This last girl, before her question, she recited these lines from the prayer for the long life of His Holiness, written by the two tutors, the late two late tutors. And it, the verse is a refrain that is found in this prayer. To you we offer our prayers with fervent devotion. That ends in Yatsu, protect the land of snows, live for a hundred eons. Shower on him your blessings so that his aspirations are fulfilled without hindrance. Your word, John so this is the prayer of the true words. You whose glory is an ocean of immeasurable qualities and who look upon poor beings as if they were your only child, so God of the past, present, and future bodhisattvas and your disciples, pray heed these lamentations of the truth. May the entire teaching of the Buddha, which dispel all the torments of existence and peace, spread to benefit the whole wide world with help and as happiness. May those who hold them, scholars and practitioners, flourish in their practice of the ten activities of dharma, utterly oppressed by the intolerable intensity of their negative actions, deprived beings are tortured by interminable suffering, pacify their unbearable best diseases, wars and famines, and bring them the succor of the infinite joy and well-being. In particular, the people of Tibet, inheritors of the Dharma, are being destroyed by the many evils of barbarian hordes, malevolent and heartless, in a river of blood and tears, arouse the force of compassion that their torment may swiftly be stopped. Those hosts of savage oppressors, cruelly crazed by their own demonic passions, who bring ruin on both others and themselves deserve our compassion. May they develop a complete vision of right and wrong and appreciate the benefits of loving care and friendship. Since a long time, the wish most dear to my heart has been for all to enjoy total freedom in a 
natural combination of spiritual and secular spheres. Grant that I may soon have the fortune to take part in that celebration. For all those who undertook hundreds of hardships for the sake of the doctrine, those who hold it in the country and their compatriots, sacrificing their cherished bodies, lives, and possessions. Lord of Padala Buddha filled, protect them with your compassion. In short, Lord, protector of Alokiteshwara, in the presence of the conquerors and the Bodhisattvas, Bodhisattva, I pray, take under your care the Buddha fields of the land of snows, that the good results of the vows aspirations you have made right now may swiftly come about. By the profound dependent arising of the absolute nature, um, emptiness and appearance, the power of the three jewels, compassion, the strength of the words of truth, and the infallible force of cause and effect. May these, uh, our aspirations to the truth, be accomplished without any inheritance. Of the Buddha. So even the Buddha's own words are questioned. So you should not just believe my words, in my words, but try to investigate them. Yeah, 
是我托的，这是的。Manhã de